Hello and welcome to Performance Tested Comfort Systems PTCS Heat Pump Sizing. If we do size heat pumps correctly, we will increase the comfort and save energy and make happy customers. Benefits of the HVA design process. Well, they don't happen by themselves, so we have to do some planning. Basically, if we get the right size heat pump, the homeowners will experience greater levels of comfort. The unit will cycle less, which is easier on the compressor. Lots of lower auxiliary heat loss, and that's a, that's a good thing. When that auxiliary heat comes on, that's when the meter really starts to spin. Fewer customer complaints, fewer go backs to the home on our own time. Lots of rules of thumbs exist out there on sizing. You know, one of the famous ones is one ton per 400 square feet. And if that was ever right, it was not on today's homes. It was probably in a house with single pane metal windows, maybe R11 in the attic, nothing in the walls, nothing in the floor, and probably a really leaky house. Uh, other folks like the size using the one CFM per square foot of house. Uh, hopefully later on today, we'll talk about sort of sizing by square footage is not such a good idea. Uh, other funny ones out there, tonnage, half the number of cylinders in the customer's biggest car or truck, uh, what's in the shop today, and you know, bigger is better, so we at least have to have a half ton bigger than our neighbor. And of course, everyone's probably seen this little comment to the right where you stand on the curb across the street and see what outline of the house covers the house. Heat loss, heat gain analysis, that's the first step in uh, sizing a heat pump. You first have to know uh, what the heat loss and heat gain happens to be. ACA, for many of you who have probably taken these classes, outlines this procedure in great detail. Manual J, by the way, which stands for Joule, calculates the heat loss and heat gain of a house. Manual S, where the S stands for selection, that tells you or gives you instructions. And I said, based on the heating and cooling load and your climate, what's the best system to pick? And Manual D gives duct design. And the reason we even mentioned uh, manual D is when we run into systems with low airflow, it's generally the ductwork that's the culprit. Correct sizing implies correct airflow. Uh, if you are going to size right, you have to install right. If we look at this graph right here, we can see that at full airflow, we have 100% of the capacity of this particular system. As we get, say, 20%, we're down to 90% capacity. Boy, if we get 30% low airflow, we're around 85%. So uh, if you're going to size right, you have to install right. Size right, you have to install right. We all kind of got funny pictures like this uh, around the shop, but uh, that adage is very true. So when it comes to doing a, a heating load or, or a cooling load, it's sort of that old Greek formula. You need the square footage, uh, the R and the U values. You need the, the, the duct multiplier. And, you know, quite honestly, the duct multiplier is a bit of a guess. Uh, we'll give you some guidance on how to pick it. And ACH, or how leaky or tight the house is, ACH standing for air changes per hour. We get to go through the selection process. And when you're putting a furnace in, you know, they come in big B to you increments, 40, 60, 80, 100, and, and so on. Uh, we don't have to be super precise. There's an old saying in the heat loss business, it's uh, horseshoes, hand grenades, and heat loss. Close really does count. It gets a little more complicated on cooling. Uh, all of a sudden, we've got put up with solar uh, coming in through the windows. So we still have to collect the square footages, the U values. Windows are, are critical. Uh, we need the U value, the solar heat gain coefficient, and the orientation. East and west windows affecting the cooling load the most because in the summer that's when the sun is low and just comes beating through those east and west facing glass. Duct multiplier, uh, it changes from winter, especially if you have duct work up in the attic. Internal gains, that's the stuff uh, people plug into their house like uh, TVs, refrigerators, freezers. And it's also us humans. And then again, on the ACH business. With heat pumps, we have to be a little more precise because the incremental size goes from 1.5 to 2, to 2.5, to 3, to 3.5. So rather than 20,000 BTU increments, we're now using 6,000 BTU increments. So being just a little more precise can go along. A word about those duct multipliers. Yeah, this house is funny and you can say, hey, don't worry, uh, you know, we got, we got a nice big return. 
and it's coming through the front door and back in through a window. And we can say, well, that's a dumb thing to do. But quite honestly, in the summertime, uh, this house would have a lower duct multiplier than if it was in the attic. And like most people on this call today probably know, attics get really hot in the summertime. Um, duct multipliers typically range from 10 to 30%. Uh, if the ducts are inside the house, uh, zero is a good number, but boy, if they're in attic and crawl spaces. But as good as you can do is uh, a, a very tight duct system with at least R8 insulation. Uh, 20% uh, starts to go up there. And honestly, if you're using 30% duct multipliers or 40% duct multipliers, uh, you really should fix the ducts before moving on. So what this chart here shows is the square feet of attic at various R values needed to create one ton of heating load. That's 12,000 BTUs in, in, in Boise, Idaho. We can see that, boy, at R0 uh, attic, uh, it only takes about 500 square feet to create uh, 12,000 BTUs of heat loss. R11, 2,500. And by the time you get to R38, you need 7,500 square feet of attic to create one ton of heating load. In, in Boise, Idaho. So yeah, it's not the square feet, it's the it's the heat loss. And this is another way of looking at the same information. This is BTUs through a 2,000 square foot of attic with various R values in Boise. Boy, you can see that R0, you know, gas furnace this to uh, handle the heat loss through the attic. By the time you get any insulation in the house at all, it starts to decrease rapidly. And by the time we get down to an R38, it's only about 3,500 BTUs of heat loss. Let's get some definitions out of the way. So we all talk about design temperature. What does it mean? Well, it's not the coldest or hottest day of the year. That's for sure. If we did that, we'd grossly oversize uh, our equipment. Winter design conditions, you can find them for 1% or 2.5%. What that means, it, it only gets colder than that given temperature, say at 1% of the hours in, in the winter time. For Boise, the average coldest temperature is minus two. That's referred to as the mean extreme. Winter design is nine degrees. That gives you quite a bit of leeway. Summer, let's face it, I don't care what the design temp is. I want it cool now. Uh, Portland has an has a interesting climate. Its winter design temperature is 23, and the summer design temperature is 86. And if anybody here uh, sells air conditioners in Portland, I bet they don't use an 86 degree uh, design temperature. We'll, we'll revisit that to see if that's a good idea. When we refer to a heating and cooling load, really what we're referring to is how many BTUs need to be removed or added to the house to maintain indoor comfort of design conditions. Typical homes have heat loss rates between 20,000 BTUs and 80,000, and cooling loads between 12,000 and 40,000. Of course, a lot of homes will fall outside of that range. So when it comes to actually sizing the equipment, we again, it assumes that we've done our, our heat loss and heat gain calculations. Most of the time, we get to relax. So when we say equipment sizing, what do we mean by that? It's sort of like uh, the dating game. You're, you're looking for the, the most compatible system to, to meet the house. And it is, it's, it's finding the best match between the loads of the house and that particular piece of equipment. What the customer wants, well, we all know what they want. They wanna be warm in winter and they wanna be cool in summer. And it's our job to provide that. What is equipment sizing really important? You know, furnaces, they have to be big enough to heat the house. Um, you know, new construction loads are usually below 20,000 BTUs. Small gas furnace we typically put in is around 40. So it's oversized by a factor of two. I don't hear a lot of problems when this happens. So I think relax. Air conditioning, because we live west of the Rockies, it means that we're lucky enough not to have high humidity during um, the summertime months. What that does, it allows us to focus on the sensible capacity of the air conditioner and not the latent capacity, latent referring to the ability of the system to remove water vapor and from the house. Heat pumps, they get a little more complicated. 
They have to be big enough to heat the house down to 30. We call that 30 degrees the balance point. Time to sweat the details a little bit. And we have to spend a little more time on picking that heat pump. Furnaces, uh, ACA says that we should not exceed 140% of the heat load of the house. That's really hard, hard to do with the uh, new pieces of equipment in, uh, in, in new homes. Typically, we're oversized by a factor of two. It's probably not the biggest problem. Uh, by the time you start the oversizing by a factor of three or four, it can certainly become a problem. Furnace sizing, it's relatively easy. All we're trying to do is to find uh, the right size of, of the furnace for the heat loss of, of the house. Say we had a heat loss of the house at 45,000 BTUs, what furnace would be the right size? Well, this one, even on high speed, uh, would be on our high fire, would be around 40K. That's too low, we're not going to do that. This one would give us 60K on high and roughly 40K on low. Sounds to me like a really good fit. About what's the right size for a house with 36,000 BTUs per hour? We go down here. This one will focus on the output, not the input. 36, I don't know. We'd have to have everything just perfect. My guess is most of you would choose the next size larger, which is fine. What makes sizing for heat pumps different from furnaces? For furnaces, uh, they maintain their output regardless of the outdoor temperature. Uh, most heat pumps, the capacity of the heat pump change with outdoor temperature. The colder it is, the smaller the capacity. Uh, this chart indicates what we said on the previous slide. And here we have an 80K, 80% gas furnace. And sure enough, whether it's 47 degrees or 35 degrees outside, the capacity is the same. Let's look at mm, a three ton heat pump. At 47 degrees, one of the AHRI rating points, sure enough, you get your, your three tons of heating. But by the time we get down to 35, we're actually closer to a, a two-ton equipment. We also have to take into account the capacity of the heat pump at various outdoor temperatures for sizing. The goal of installing heat pumps in the PTCS program is to keep the electric strip heat off. Let's just say we install a three-ton heat pump with all the fans running. That heat pump's going to draw about 3 kW. Say we put in 15 kW worth of backup heat. As soon as that backup heat came on, it'd be 15 kW plus the 3 kW from uh, the compressor and the fans. Boom, we got 18 kW worth of heat going under that house. You basically increase the draw by a factor of six. And that's when the meter starts to spin and the bills start to go up. The goal really is to minimize the amount of strip heat or auxiliary heat that the system has to use to maintain comfort in the house. Uh, this is a very detailed capacity output chart uh, for a particular manufacturer that some of you probably recognize. This is going to be their two and a half ton system and the two AHRI rating points, 47 and 30. We can see that it gives you 28K at 47 and about 19K at 30. To size right, you really do need the detailed capacity tables from the manufacturer. This is a single stage compressor capacity chart. And we can see it's pretty much linear. The warmer it is outside, the greater the capacity of the system. There's this little knee here, often referred to as the defrost knee, because when the system is in defrost, obviously the capacity per hour goes down. This is a very traditional uh, capacity curve. Now with inverter driven systems and cold climate systems, we can see the lines aren't quite the same anymore. This particular system, and it's a carrier system, uh, its peak capacity is at roughly 25 degrees, which is a pretty nice fit. And you can see it's actually got greater capacity at 25 than it does at, at 52. And, and that makes sense. Uh, our houses don't need to have the full capacity of heat pump running when it's, when it's warm outside. And then we have that typical sort of capacity uh, decline. But rather than starting, you know, at, at 60 degrees, it starts around 25 degrees and goes down. Uh, this is another uh, extended capacity or cold climate heat pump. Uh, you've got this nice flat performance curve between 47 and roughly 32. And in the Northwest, we spend a lot of our hours in, in that temperature range. 